1863. On the reverse was stamped in figures that cut into the card, the exact weight of the metal. The entire business was transacted without the agent of the government ever touching the gold or the receipt for it. From the scales the metal was passed to the assayer nearby, who put a stamp under the weight, indicating its fineness and then it was tagged and carried to a vault-like storeroom. Passing to another department, for the place was arranged similar to a great bank, the professor laid down his card and had counted out to him a pile of bills something like bank checks, ruled crossways on the back to hold many signatures, aggregating 654 DMs, the alloy in the gold making it worth 12 DMs less than the quoted price. These bills were handed over to me and the business was completed. The whole transaction consumed scarcely more time than it takes to describe it and we went from there to the marine office where we met the president, and the three of us lunched with the director of navigation at a hotel. At two o'clock, we repaired to the station to take the cars for the capital of the republic. The president and Professor Morris were recognized and greeted courteously by almost everyone we met, but there was no groveling or sycophancy. I could scarcely realize that I was in the company of the president of a great nation, so simple and unpretentious were his manners and carriage. He carried his own carpet bag in his hand and seemed to expect no more deference than anybody else. Professor Morris purchased my ticket for me and we sat down with a number of others in a comfortable waiting room and in a few minutes a porter came in and announced that the Capital City Express was waiting. We went through a gate where our tickets were taken up and passed into the cars. These cars were 4 feet wide, 6 feet high and 24 feet long. The seats extended entirely across the car and there was no provision made for walking about in the coach. Between every two seats, placed to face each other, a door opened from the side, so that they were practically compartment cars with room in each compartment for four persons. There were a dozen or fifteen of these cars in the train, but no locomotive, engineer, or conductor was in sight. I noticed that the end of the car at the front of the train was pointed like the bow of a boat and when the passengers were ushered into the cars, the doors were all locked from the outside. A full description of these railroads with detail drawings and specifications of their entire equipment is furnished with my official report, but will not be injected into this narrative, as it would doubtless be tedious to the lay reader. In order though that my reader may better understand the plan of the cars I have been describing, L will state that this railroad was an elevated affair, massive iron pillars set in the ground like those zero and which are laid, the elevated railroads of New York. There was no heavy superstructure though, as in American elevated railways. The tracks or girders on which the cars run, being placed, one at the top and the other about six feet lower down, thus making one track directly above the other instead of being side by side, as on American railways. The cars were elevated on an average about 10 feet from the ground. On account of depressions they sometimes ran considerably higher, but never less than 10 feet over a road or lower than 6 feet anywhere. Thus, they could encounter no obstacles and were so attached to the track that they could not fly off even if the wheels on which they ran were broken or detached. The railway was double-tracked, that is there were two sets of tracks, one on either side of the upright iron pillars and the cars on opposite sides, ran in opposite directions, so they could never collide. The columns which supported this novel railway were set about the same distance apart as those of an American elevated road and as they took up scarcely any room and required no right of way, the road ran through farms and villages without danger or inconvenience to anybody. The freight cars, of which I saw a great many standing in the government storehouse, or exchange, were simply iron cylinders of about the same size as the passenger cars. The passenger trains were run in the daytime and the freight trains at night. This description applies to all of the railroads in the Republic, except some roads, which were built for carrying coal, ores, etc. These run underground. These roads are run entirely different from American railways, trains never stopping at stations to put off or take on passengers. After it leaves the starting point, 
a car never stops till it reaches its destination where it is switched down from the main line and rests on a track underneath it and on a level with the floor of the station. For instance, the train we took at Corinthus, never slackened speed a particle from the time it got underway until it ran down on its siding at Ironia, some 700 miles distant. No car ever stop on the main line and by a very ingenious arrangement, cars on the main line can never get within less than 10 miles of each other. The motive power is electricity and when they get closer together than 10 miles, the current is cut off from the rear train so that it loses speed. I have, as I have said, a full technical description of this railway system, furnished me by the government engineer, for it goes without saying that it is owned and managed entirely by the government. In a few moments after the bustling porter ushered us into our compartment, we started off with a gentle motion which increased until within less than two minutes, we were flying across the country with a velocity I never conceived of before. There was no noise, no jar, the motion being more like that of a flying iceboat or smooth toboggan slide, than anything else. The President and Professor Morris endeavored to draw me into conversation, but a faintness and dizziness came over me so prostrating that I seemed on the verge of collapse. I struggled against it and brought to bear all the force of will I possessed, but the fearful speed completely unnerved me. The cars being elevated above the ground and the windows but little below the level of the eye, we could only see the landscape at some distance and as it flew by I felt as if I were imprisoned in a great cannonball being fired through space. Cold perspiration broke out on me and try as I might, it was impossible for me to conceal my distress. It was not fear, for I knew from the construction of the cars and road that an accident was reasonably impossible and I was assured by my companions that a fatal accident had never occurred on the road. It was only the smooth, noiseless, terrible speed that affected me and within an hour it wore off and I was myself again and began to take a lively interest in the country through which we were passing. As we sped on through great tracts of country covered with farms, towns and villages, over great rivers, across hills and valleys, it made a flying panorama beautiful beyond description. Frequently we intersected other roads like ours with flying cars, crossing either above or below them. It was not long after I had recovered sufficiently to become interested in the outside world, before I observed what, strangely enough, I had not noticed before. That was people flying about the country with the greatest ease and grace. I had not noticed any suggestion of aerial navigation at Corinthus, but Professor Morris told me that if I had been in the suburbs, I would have seen hundreds of people out every fine afternoon flying for pleasure. I was not surprised to see the air navigated, for I had long been of the opinion that it was only a matter of time when the feat would be accomplished in America. I was surprised though at the simplicity of the flying machines. I had been accustomed to think of a practical flying machine as something very complicated and large, a kind of balloon, car, and steamboat combined. But here were people flying about with the greatest ease, with nothing but a sail drawn over a frame like a great bird's wings, underneath which they swung like a spider under his web. A propelling wheel of the same materials was driven sometimes by light machinery, but most often by the muscles of the flyers. It all seemed so easily and gracefully done that I could not help wondering that people were not flying the world over. How is it, I asked my companions, that people here seem to do so easily what we have labored vainly so many years in my country to accomplish. Are you stronger, or is the atmosphere more dense? Neither one nor the other, answered Professor Morris. You people have always gone at it the wrong way, or had, up to the time I left the country. You have been swallowed up with the idea of machinery. You have seen birds carry their own weight and twice as much besides, with ease, you have seen clumsy squirrels expand their skins by stretching out their legs and make astonishing flights through the air, and yet though knowing that man is one of the strongest animals in the world to his size, it has not yet occurred to you to apply that strength intelligently in the effort to fly. Really, your attempts at flying have been quite as ridiculous as it would be to attempt to swim by machinery. 
with a light aeroplane having the requisite area of surface and a simple gear with which he could apply the strength of his back, arms, and legs to a propelling fan, your boys, with the opportunity, would learn to fly quite as easily as they learn to swim. All you require to enable young America to acquire expertness in the air as he does in the water and on the ice, is the simple aeroplane and a high wire 2 or 300 feet in length from which he could suspend himself while learning to manipulate his flyer. A moment's reflection convinced me that the professor was right and during the entire trip, nothing interested me so much as to watch the graceful flyers of whom there were nearly always some in view. I inquired if there were not a very great many casualties resulting from such hazardous exercises and was informed that there were none at all. That if anything should happen to the aeronaut in midair, the aeroplane would let him down to earth as gently as a parachute and without danger. Seeing how absorbed I was with the outside view and appreciating my curiosity, my companions very considerately left me to myself for the most part of the journey, while they discussed matters of interest to the country at large. We arrived at the capital at 6 o'clock, making the 700 miles in 4 hours and 25 minutes. When we reached our destination and the train stopped, the doors were opened for the first time since we started and descending we found ourselves in a large vaulted room surrounded by all the bustle incident to a great and prosperous city. Professor Morris called a carriage and parting from President Wilkes, who cordially invited me to call on him at the executive department, we took our seats and were driven or propelled rather, through wide tree-bordered streets to the professor's home in the suburbs. Being but a dull practical clod, language fails me to describe the feelings and impressions of that hour. The streets were brilliantly lighted and were filled with gaily dressed people, some walking, some riding in carriages or on bicycles, some standing in knots about the corners or sitting on rustic iron seats under the trees along the curb, and notwithstanding the great concourse there was no noise except the laughter and conversation of the people. As in Corin thus, there was not a horse to be seen, all of the conveyances being self-propelling. The light and glamour, the beautiful costumes, the noiseless, swiftly moving carriages all seemed like a dream of fairyland. In the delightful home of my countrymen and patron, there was not so much to remind me that I was in a strange country. The decorations and furnishings were not so different from that of the best houses in America, except that besides real works of art there seemed to be a strict adherence to the rule that everything that was there was there for use. There was no piling up of heterogeneous and conglomerate masses of trumpery such as is to be found in many so-called fashionable houses of America under the general term of brick ABAC. The general style of furnishing was something between American luxuriousness and Japanese simplicity and utility. The room into which I was ushered seemed to be a parlor, library, and general receiving room all in one and was warmed by electricity, but that cheerful glow which the sight of a ruddy fire imparts, was obtained by having an open grate piled with inconsumable faggots that blazed white and red when the current was turned on. A handsome instrument reaching almost to the ceiling, and which I afterwards found to be a combination pipe organ and grand piano, stood in one comer and by it, a music rack piled with what appeared to be a great variety of music. After conducting me into this room and requesting me to make myself at home, my host stepped to the mantel over which was a transmitter something like what I had seen in the office of the Director of Navigation at Corin thus, and pulled out a stop, whereupon in tones sweet and rich, but soft, and low the most beautiful orchestral music seemed to float in and fill the room. He then excused himself and withdrew saying that he would rejoin me directly. I was so charmed with the music that sounded like the far-off strains of some grand orchestra, that I made no note of time and was only recalled to my surroundings when Professor Morris advanced into the room leading a handsome woman of middle age who he introduced to me as his wife. Extending her hand she greeted me most cordially, while the professor shut off the music, welcoming me to her country and particularly to her home. I acknowledged her courtesy in the best language I was able to command and expressed my sincere and heartfelt gratitude for the warm welcome I had received from everyone I had met especially from herself and generous husband. My hostess was dressed 